Amen. All right, we're there. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter number 36. And if I want you to notice there in verse number 1, go ahead and read the first few verses. The Bible says, And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah, and against all the nations, from the day that I spake unto thee from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. So uh, we're in a really busy time right now in the nation of Judah. There's a lot going on. So I think it'll be helpful if we look at the context of where we are right now in their history. Keep your place in Jeremiah 36 because we're going to be here for the rest of the evening. But turn, if you will, to 2 Kings 23. If we want to get the context of where we are in their history, we're going to want to start with the king named Josiah. So Josiah was the king who was king when God first called Jeremiah. He's best known for leading Judah into the greatest revival that they had ever known. If, you ever, if you're familiar with 2 Kings 23, most of the chapter is just about his revival and what he did for God and the altars he tore down and all those great things he did for God. If you're there in 2 Kings 23, look at verse 25. The Bible says, and like unto him, talking about Josiah, was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses? Neither after him arose there any like him. So Josiah was a great th king. He did a lot of good things for God. And uh, although he was a really good king, he made some mistakes in his life. 21 years after his uh, revival he led, he decides to go fight against Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt. And God did not call him to go to this battle. He was actually warned not to go into this battle. He was told, it has nothing to do with you, Josiah, stay out of this. But he decided to go fight it anyway, and he ends up dying there. And it's really at this point when Josiah dies in battle, you can kind of mark where God's judgment began. God's judgment that had been uh, building up for generations and generations. This is really the point where it kind of just, it all went downhill from here. Uh, after Josiah dies, they make Jehoahaz, his son, king. And about three months later, Pharaoh Necho, who Josiah died fighting against, decides to go invade Jerusalem. He's probably pretty annoyed that uh, Josiah did that. So he goes, he invades Jerusalem. Look at verse 34, see what happens next. 2 Kings uh, 23, 34. And Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in the room of Josiah's father and turned his name to Jehoiakim. So this is our king in our story tonight. And took Jehoahaz away, and he came to Egypt and died there. So he comes, he invades Jerusalem, he takes Jehoahaz captive into Egypt, where he'll eventually die, and he makes another one of Josiah's sons, uh, who is most commonly referred to as Jehoiakim, the king. And then uh, later he, he requires the nation to basically pay a tax or a fee. Uh, Jehoiakim pays that, and Pharaoh Necho leaves Judah alone. And this is where our story begins tonight. We begin when, during the reign of Jehoiakim. And obviously, you know, this is what has recently happened is not good, but God's judgment has only just begun. Uh, if you're there and go back to Jeremiah 36, that'll be know a little bit of the context where we are. We'll go ahead and read real quick that again. And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that, the wor that this word came into Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, so look what God's telling Jeremiah to do. Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah, and against all the nations, from the day that I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. So he says, I want you to take a book. I want you to write in it all the words, all the judgments, all the terrible things I've told you so far. And uh, we see the purpose here. The purpose is because God is still merciful. Verse number 3 says, It may be that the hells of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. So obviously God's going to certainly judge Judah if he has to, but he'd rather them just get right. He'd rather them just turn from their ways and get right. So let's see what happens next. Jeremiah 36 verse 4. Then Jeremiah called Barak, the son of Neriah, and Barak wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him upon our wool of a book. Jeremiah commanded Barak, saying, I am shut up, I cannot go into the house of the Lord. Therefore go thou, and read in the roll which thou hast written from my mouth the words of the Lord in the ears of the people in the Lord's house upon the fasting day, and also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come 
out of their cities. And again, we see the purpose. It may be that they will present their supplication before the Lord and will return everyone from his evil way. For great is the anger and the fury of the Lord that the Lord hath pronounced against this people. And Barak the son of Neriah did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading in the book of the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. So for whatever reason, Jeremiah is not able to go into the temple to do this. So he tells uh, Barak, who's a scribe, we kind of see Barak with Jeremiah throughout his ministry. And he says, all right, write the words. And on a certain day, you're going to go into the temple and you're going to read these words, these terrible judgments. You're going to go and you're going to read these before all Judah. So uh, the title of the sermon tonight is Making Intercession for God's Word. And we're going to look at some men later in our story uh, tonight who made intercession for the Word of God. And I want to talk about how we as Christians need to be making intercession for the Word of God in the midst of a world that despises it and what it means to do so. So first tonight, to make intercession for God's Word, we must fear it. Let's continue our story. Verse 9. And it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord to all the people in Jerusalem and to all the people that came from the cities of Judah into Jerusalem. So it's, it is the day that God appointed. Uh, it's, this is the day Barak's going to go in the temple and read the book. Uh, then Barak, then read Barak in the book, all the words, the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord in the chamber of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the scribe, in the higher court at the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house and the ears of all the people. So Barak is reading this book in the temple. He's specifically located in a chamber by, uh, of a man, of a scribe named Gemariah. Verse 11, when Micaiah, the son of Gemariah, so this is the Gemariah's son, the son of Shaphan had heard out of the book all the words of the Lord. So his son hears all these terrible things. He hears all these judgments. Uh, let's see what he does. Then he, went, then he went down into the king's house, into the scribe's chamber, and lo, all the princes sat there, even Lishem the scribe, and Deliah the son of Shemaiah, and Elnathan the son of Akbor, and Gemariah the son of Shaphan, and Zedekiah the son of Hananiah, and all the princes. Then Micaiah declared unto them all the words that he had heard when Barak read the book in the ears of the people. So he goes and gets his dad uh, and all the other scribes that are sitting there, and he basically tells them all these terrible things, uh, all these judgments, that Barak is reading. Verse 14, Therefore all the princes sent Jehudai, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Shemamiah, the son of Cushai, unto Barak, saying, Take in thine hand the rule wherein thou hast read in the ears of the people, and come. So Barak, the son of Neriah, took the roll in his hand and came unto them. And they said unto him, Sit down now and read it in our ears. So Barak read it in their ears. Now it came to pass, I want you to notice this, now it came to pass, when they had heard all the words, when Barak comes to them and he gives them the word of God and he, and he shows them the judgments that God has. It says, they were afraid. Both one and another and said to Barak, we will surely tell the king of all these words. So if you've ever read the book of Jeremiah or the other prophets, you know this is true. But uh, normally what the usual uh, response is to somebody of importance, whether it's the king or a scribe or a governor, when, uh, when somebody of importance usually hears the word of God being preached, usually what they do is they would throw Jeremiah in prison or whoever it was, they'd beat him, they'd threaten him. They normally did not take this very well, but not with these scribes. In fact, we're going to see later in our sermon that it is these scribes who made intercession for God's word. You say, well, why? Why did they not respond in a negative way to God's message? The answer is in verse 16, because it says, when they had heard all the words, they were afraid. See, they were afraid of God's judgments. They were afraid of God. And in the same way, if we want to successfully intercede for God's word, we have to actually fear him ourselves. Amen. Turn to Proverbs 1.7. Proverbs 1.7. While you're turning there, I'm going to read you Proverbs 3.7 that says, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Proverbs 1, 7, if you're there, the Bible says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Turn to Proverbs 14, 16. Proverbs 14, 16. So here's what this verse is saying. If you fear God, you have knowledge. If you don't, you're a fool. And you say, well, why am I a fool if I don't fear God? What about not fearing God makes me a fool? Well, if you're there in Proverbs 14, 16, we find the answer. It says, A wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth, notice this, and is confident. 
one attribute of a fool is it says a fool is confident. Now obviously there's a right way to be bold and confident, but when, it's, when this says a fool rageth and is confident, it's saying that in a negative way. Turn to Proverbs, uh, I'm sorry, Exodus 9.13. Exodus 9.13. The thing about a fool that, uh, that makes them a fool if they don't fear God is because if you're confident and you're bold against God, you don't fear God. You're not afraid of God's judgments on your life. You, uh, you're confident. That's what, whenever somebody does anything uh, stupid and immature, it's probably because they're just, they have this mentality that they're confident, they're bold in obviously a, a negative way. And uh, there's, I love Exodus chapter 9 if you're there because this is a perfect example we literally see played out of this, what we see in Proverbs 14 and 16. Uh, in verse 13, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart, and upon thine servants, and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. So we're in Exodus here at the time of the plagues that God brought upon Egypt. Skip down to verse number 18 for sake of time. The Bible says, Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. So God's going to bring a hail. It's a very grievous hail. We're going to see how devastating it is here in the next verse. But God is still going to give the Egyptians a warning. He says, Send therefore now, and gather thy cattle, and all that thou hast in the field, for upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field, and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them, and they shall die. So God's saying, this hail is going to be so bad that anything that is left outside is going to die. So he's warning them, and he's saying, bring your servants, bring your cattle inside so they, they are not harmed by the hail. In verse 20, we kind of see this compare and contrast of people who fear God and the fools who don't. It says, he that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh, made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses, and he that regarded not the word of the Lord. So here's your fools, they're confident, they're bold, they don't care about what God says. When the man of God comes and says, God's going to destroy your cattle, he's going to bring a hail, uh, you better listen and do what God says. They don't care. They, it says they regarded not the word of the Lord, left his servants and his cattle in the field. And of course we know what happens. Those who listened to God and brought their animals and their servants inside, everything was fine. But anybody who left their cattle, their servants outside, they died. And so you say, well, how important is it that I fear God? You know, is it, I mean, I get we're supposed to do it. Is it really something that's a fundamental of the faith? And turn to Jeremiah 5.23. Jeremiah 5.23, while you're turning there, I'll read you Deuteronomy 5.29. It says, oh that, oh, that there was such a heart in them, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. So here's what God's saying. He's saying, fear me, and it'll go well with you. It'll be, I'll, I'll bless you if you fear me. He said, well, what if I don't? What is the consequence of not fearing God? Jeremiah 5, 23, the Bible says, But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Neither say there in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God, that giveth rain, both the former and the latter in his season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of harvest. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things for, for, from you. So here's the chain reaction, all right? You don't fear God, then you fall into sin and then God judges you. That's what happens with the nation of Judah. The reason that God destroyed them, the reason that he brought his judgment upon them was because they didn't fear God, and the result of that, they fell into sin, and as a result of that, God destroyed them. Amen. So we just need to make sure we keep in mind and we know that we fear God. Because look, even from a completely selfish perspective, if you want, your, if you want yourself to be blessed and you want it to go well with you, you should fear God. You should fear God because God says, fear me and it'll be well with you. If you don't, you're going to get destroyed. You're going to, I will judge you. So we see if we're going to intercede for God and his word, we must fear him ourselves. So first tonight, I said to make intercession for God's word, we must fear it. But second tonight, to make intercession for God's word, we must further it. Uh, let's continue our story in verse 16. 
And now it came to pass, when they had heard all the words, they were afraid, both one and the other. It said unto Barak, notice this, we will surely tell the king of all these words. And they asked Barak, saying, Tell us now, how didst thou write all these words at his mouth? The Barak answered them, He pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in the book. Then said the princes unto Barak, Go, hide thee, thou and Jeremiah, and let no man know where ye be. So I just want you to notice again that they are on his side. They are agreeing with him. They are uh, genuinely afraid of the word of God. Uh, but verse 20 says, And they went into the king, into the court. Uh, but they laid up the roll in the chamber of Elisha with the scribe and told all the words in the ears of the king. So uh, at this point, because I said we must, to make intercession for God's word, we must further it. And I want to real quick just give three reasons we should do that. Why should we further God's word? Why should we uh, promote God's word? Well, one, and I know this isn't really too deep, but it's true, but we should further God's word because it's just common sense. I want you to notice these scribes here, that's why they did this. It wasn't, they weren't, Barak is not telling them you need to go tell other people is what happened is they heard this they were afraid of it and they said we need to tell the king we need to tell somebody about this which makes sense because you know put yourself in their shoes your whole entire nation you just learn from God that your entire nation is going to be wiped out and destroyed soon and you find that out you tell people <laughs> that's just what they did here they they heard this and the first thing they said is we will surely tell the king of all these words. They said, we need to tell somebody about this. We need to make sure people know about this. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4.13. How about this? If you find out that the entire planet is going to burn in hell if they don't hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, you tell people. Right. This is what you do. It's not rocket science. It's just common sense. We're there in 2 Corinthians 4.13. I love this verse because it kind of uh, gets this idea across that preaching the gospel, it's just, it's not a big special, it's just common sense. 2 Corinthians 4.13, Bible says, We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written. So Paul's about to quote Psalm 116, verse 10 here. He says, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. I mean, it's not rocket science. He's like, I believe, so I speak. It's that simple. I believe. I learned that I was, I was saved from eternity burning in hell, so therefore, for that reason, I speak. It's, it's just it's something you do. You would think, you know, if you see someone walking towards a cliff, in, I mean, it, it wouldn't be considered a super heroic thing if you went and told them, hey, there's a cliff right there. It's just common sense. It's just what you would do. But second, obviously, we should further God's word because it's just common sense. But second... We should further God's word because we're disobeying Christ if we don't. Turn to 1 Corinthians 9.16. While you're turning there, I'll read you Mark 16.15. We all know it. I'm sure a lot of you have it memorized. It says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's not a suggestion. That's a command. Amen. It's a command. Preaching the gospel is it's a command for us to do in our life. There in 1 Corinthians 9.16. It says, For though I preach the gospel... I have nothing to glory of, right? That's kind of what we just mentioned, right? It's just common sense. Even if you preach the gospel, you don't really have anything to brag about. It's not anything special. It's just, it's, it's, it's something that you do because obviously Christ commanded you, but it's just common sense. Let's uh, finish reading. It says, For necessity is laid upon me, notice this, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Here's what Paul's saying. He's saying, I better preach the gospel because if I don't, I'm in trouble. <laughs> he's, he's saying, Woe is unto me, saying, I am in trouble if I ever would stop preaching the gospel. Curtis Hudson said this, he said, The only alternative to soul winning is disobedience to Christ. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 2.3. 1 Thessalonians 2.3. I'm going to read you Matthew 12.30. The Bible says, He, this is something Jesus said, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Look, you're either helping gather or you're scattering. If you're not helping uh, further the gospel and further God's word, you're hindering it. That's just how it works. That's what Jesus said. So first, we should further God's word because it's just common sense. Second, we should further God's word because we're disobeying Christ if we don't. But third, we should further God's word because God trusts us with it. If you're there in 1 Thessalonians 2.3, the Bible says this, for our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But look at this. But as we were, I love this phrase. I love this mentality that Paul the Apostle had. 
as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. You know, I think the reason, I, I do believe that one of the main reasons that Paul did so much for the gospel, the reason that Paul, uh, just his whole life, he, just, he did so many great things for God and did so many great things for the gospel, is because of this mentality he had that the gospel is it's something I'm trusted with. It's not mine. It's something I'm trusted with by God. Because here's the thing. When you understand that you're trusted with something, you understand that it's not yours to do whatever you want with it. If God trusts you with something, you don't have the luxury of deciding to play it by your rules. When God trusts you with something, you do it His way. Turn to Matthew 25, 24. Matthew 25, 24. Let me turn there myself. You say, what happens if I'm not a good steward of what God gives me? What happens if you trust me with the gospel and I just really don't do anything with it? Well, let's uh, look at, actually, let's, if you're Matthew 25, let's start reading in verse 14. Matthew 25, 14. We're reading about the parable of the talents. Starting verse 14, the Bible says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received five talents went and traded with the same, and made them, made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained another two. But he that had received the one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that received five talents came and besought, uh, brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest, deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. So we're not, just skip down, if you will, to verse 24. But basically what happens now is the first two servants, all three servants were trusted with their Lord's money. And the first two servants were wise with it. They did what their Lord wanted them to do with the money. But this third servant, he, he, what he did, the, the, his Lord was not happy with. Let's look at verse 24. Then he, which had received the one talent, came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou wert a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed, and I was afraid. Isn't that the reason if we ever don't serve God in our life or don't do something he wants us to do, isn't that why we do it? We're afraid of, uh, we're afraid of people, we're afraid of our coworkers, we're afraid of money, we're afraid of whatever it is. This is why we, we do that. Uh, and I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth, and lo, here thou hast that is thine. So he gives the, his Lord the talent back. Verse 26, his Lord answered and said to him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Now, this may see, seem a little extreme at first. I mean, if you think about it, he didn't lose the talent. It's not like he gave him the talent and then he lost it, and he didn't give it back to him. He gave it back. He trusted him with something and he returned it to him in one piece. He said, lo, here thou hast that is thine. You say, why was he so mad? I mean, wicked and slothful, that's, that's pretty serious, right? Well, let's look at verse 27. Thou oughtest therefore to have. So here's what he wanted him to do. Put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming, I should have received my own with usury. Look, when God entrusts us with the gospel, he doesn't want us just returning the gospel back to him. He wants the gospel back with usury, with the souls that were saved along with it. And this is the mentality that we need to have. When we, when we die, we need to make sure that we had the usury. We actually had the fruits of what God entrusted us with. And like I, like, I, like I said, when we get this mentality that the gospel is something we're trusted with, and so when we understand that, once we get that, we understand that the gospel is not ours to do whatever we want with it. It's we play by God's rules. Amen. So first tonight, I said to make intercession for God's word, we must fear it. Second, I said to make intercession for God's word, we must further it. And we saw that, that the reasons we should is because it's common sense. We're disobeying Christ if we don't. And God trusts us with it. But third tonight, to make intercession for God's word, we must be faithful with it. Let's continue our story, verse 21. So basically, they just heard the word of God. The scribes heard the word of God. They said, we're going to tell the king. We've got to tell somebody about this. So they go and they tell the king, verse 21. So the king sent Jehudai to fetch the roll. 
and he took it out of Elisha the scribe's chamber. And Jehudai read it in the ears of the king and in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king. Now the king sat in the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. So just to set the scene a little bit, you have the scribes here, barracks probably with them. They have the scroll that they're reading to the king, and then you have the king and all his servants, and there is a fire there. There's a hearth burning uh, there. <clears throat> Verse 23, And it came to pass that when Jehudai had read three or four leaves, he didn't even get to finish. He, he didn't get to finish. When Jehudai had read three or four leaves, he, referring to the king, cut it with the penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Can you imagine, you know, I mean, you read this and you think, how can somebody do that? I mean, even just the average unsaved person out there probably wouldn't, probably would feel a little weird burning a Bible. You say, how could somebody just go and just, just feel p p p normally fine just burning God's word? Well, the answer is in verse 24. Here's why. Yet they were not afraid. Do you remember when Barak went to the scribes and he read them the word of God? Remember their first reaction? What did it say? It says they were afraid. But here's the thing. The world out there, they're not afraid. Now, I'm, not, I'm not saying that every unsaved person out there is wicked King Jehoiakim. That's not what I'm getting at. But the world in general, they just don't fear God. That's why they live their lives contrary to God's word. That's why they don't care about God's word. That's why when you ask them, do you know for sure you died today to go to heaven? That's why most people say, eh, no thanks, I'm not interested. Because most people just have no regard for God's word, and it's because they're not afraid. They have no fear of God. Yet they were not afraid, nor rent their garments, neither the king nor any of his servants heard all these words. I mean, can you imagine being Barak? I mean, the Bible says that Barak was first told to do this in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, and he read it in the fifth year. And I'm not saying it took him a whole year to write it, but can you imagine spending all this time writing this? I mean, there was no uh, Office Pro printers back then. Everything was written by hand. He wrote the whole thing by hand. The Bible says here that Jehu and I read three or four leaves. We don't even know what else. It was at least three or four pages long. That's a lot. Can you imagine just watching someone just burn that? Can you imagine someone walking up to you and taking your King James Bible and just ripping those words up? Rips up John, rips up Matthew, rips up Romans, and just throwing it into a fire right in front of your eyes? Can you imagine how frustrating that would be? But I want you to notice verse 25. This is kind of our key verse for the sermon tonight. Nevertheless, so the roll was just burned, but it says, Nevertheless, Elnathan and Deliah and Gemariah had made intercession to the king that he would not burn the roll, but he would not hear them. You know, sometimes it can get a little disappointing or discouraging because, you know, we go to church three times a week, you know, we go to church Sunday morning, come back Sunday night, come back Thursday night, come back the next Sunday, the next Sunday night, the next Thursday, week after week, month after month, uh, year after year. We, we try to read our Bibles every day and pray every day and, you know, week after week, month after month. We try to go soul winning and we, we, we try so hard to fear God's word and just give our lives to make intercession for God's word, right? And sometimes, it still seems, figuratively, figuratively speaking, of course, they still burn their role, right? The world still disrespects God's word. They still don't want to hear it. They still, they just don't regard it. They live contrary to God's word. I mean, the average person out there is involved in sins that they think are perfectly normal but are actually serious sins in the light of the Bible, right? Because they just don't fear God's word and they don't, they, they, don't, they don't care about it. They say, well, what should we do, right? What's our response to that? Should we slow down, take it down a notch, I mean, serve God a little less? What should we do? Well, see what God said about all this. Verse 26, it gets even worse, by the way. What the king commanded, Jer Jeremiah, the son of Hamalek, and Sarai, the son of Azrael, and Shemamiah, the son of Abdeel, to take Barak the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet but the Lord hid them. So it gets even worse. He sends these guys to find Barak and find Jeremiah and basically arrest him. And, and, but look what God says in verse 28, or 27, I'm sorry. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after that the king had burned the roll and all the words which Barak wrote at the mouth of Jeremiah saying, take thee yet again, or take thee again another roll and write in it all the former words that were in the first roll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, hath burned. Here's what God said. He said, do it all over again. Do it again. Keep going. Don't stop. God didn't say, 
you know, take a break, take, give it a few months. He said, no, go back and rewrite the whole thing again. And this is what God's commandment is to us. And in fact, he actually had them do something else. He actually had them do even more. Verse 29, And thou shalt say to Jehoiakim king of Judah, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast burned this rule, saying, Why hast thou written therein, saying, The king of Babylon shall certainly come and destroy all this land, and shall cause to cease from thence a man and beast. Therefore thus saith the Lord of Jehoiakim king of Judah. I love how he phrased that. He's like, yeah, I know you burned the rule, Jehoiakim, but I'm still the Lord of Jehoiakim king of Judah. I'm still your Lord. I don't care if you're saved or not. I don't care if you're a reprobate or not. I am still Lord over you. I still am in charge. Therefore thus saith the Lord of Jehoiakim king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out in the day to the heat, and in the night to the frost, and I will punish him and his seed and his servants for their iniquity, and I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the men of Judah all the evil that I have pr pronounced against them, but they hearken not. Here's what God said. He said, rewrite the whole thing, and on top of that, I want you to go back to the king. You know the king who just tried to arrest you? You know the king who probably wishes you were dead? I want you to go to him, and I want you to tell him to his face that I'm going to punish him, punish his nation, kill him, and throw his dead body out to rot in the heat. Amen. I don't think he had any intentions of, like, having them slow down, Amen. take a little bit of a break. God said, keep going, and you know what? And so much more. And here's why. I mean, think about it like this. Imagine like we're having, we're, we're having a match, a tug-of-war with the world, right? And we're over here pulling on this side, and the world's, world's pulling here on this side. What would we do if you were playing tug of war with somebody and they started pulling a little harder than you, right? The world hates God even more every day. The world, the world disregards God even more. What would you do? Would you just like let go of the rope? Would you like slack off a little bit? No, that's the last thing you do. If the world starts pulling harder, you pull even harder than them. And that's what God was telling them. He's like, all right, you know, he's going to come at me. He's going to uh, burn my role and disregard me even more. Then you know what? Rewrite the role, and on top of that, go tell him this. Turn to Ezekiel 2.6. Ezekiel 2.6. Say, but the world won't listen to the word of God. The world doesn't care about the word of God. There's so few people out there who will even let us preach the gospel to them. Most people, just, they, they just don't care. It's not that they're wicked, evil people. They just don't care. Say, so what do we do? Ezekiel 2.6. I, I love these verses. God talking to the prophet Ezekiel. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with me, and thou just dwell among scorpions. Today we dwell among scorpions. Briars and thorns are with us. He says, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. He says, you know what? I know they don't want to listen. I know they're a rebellious house. Next verse. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, Notice this, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious, but thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. He says, don't be rebellious like they are. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was written therein. Sound familiar? And he spread it before me, and it, and it was written within, without, and there was written therein lamentations, and mourning, and a woe. It's not a very pleasant message, but you know what God says? He says, I know they don't care about my word. I know they've forgotten me. I know they're rebellious. But he said, whether they hear or not, I want you to intercede for my word anyway. And that's God's commandment to us. It's whether, see, look, what the world does and their response to this book has nothing to do with what we do with it. It doesn't matter whether they agree with the word, the, the word of God or they disagree with it. That doesn't matter. We shouldn't change. We shouldn't back off. No matter what, what, whether it's just the world's reaction or discouragement or just, you know, obstacles in the Christian life, we should not slow down. Amen. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4 8. 2 Corinthians 4 8. Look, God's word doesn't lose its power just because people don't want to hear it. In fact, I, you know, it seems the, usually the, the way it goes is the more people don't like God's word, the more power it has. Amen. There in 2 Corinthians 4.8, I'll wait till you get there. 2 Corinthians 4.8, the Bible says this, we are troubled on every side. Aren't we, aren't we troubled on every side from just people who, like I said, aren't necessarily wicked, evil people, but just have forgotten God, 
really care about God. And so sometimes it can get, you know, frustrating just being surrounded by a world of people like that. Yeah. Notice this, yet not distressed. We are perplexed. Sometimes it can be just kind of perplexing to seeing all the sin and the wickedness out there, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Didn't someone tell us, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee? Amen. Right? Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Look, no matter the obstacle and no matter the discouragement, we are we're expected to keep serving God. Not even just not even just stop completely, but just slowing down. We're, we're, we're expected just to keep going and to keep serving God no matter what. You know, sometimes I think, you know, we're running, we're running the Christian race. We're, we're go everything's going great, we're, we're doing good, we're fighting the good fight of faith. And sometimes I think God himself kind of puts an obstacle in our way. Something that maybe would slow us down a little. And you say, well, why would God do that? Why would God put something in our way that would uh, hinder us from serving him? You say, why would he do that? Because you know, sometimes I think God does is just want, he just wants to test us. He wants to test us, and he puts something in our way, and he says, I know this may slow him down, and I know it's going to make it harder, and they may get a little weary, and it, 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 they may have the temptation to slow down, but I'm going to put this here, because I just want to watch and see if they're going to slow down a little, if they're going to stop, or they're going to you know, drag their feet a little bit. So look, when obstacles come our way, you know, we ought to accept that as a, as a challenge. You ought to realize that when, when uh, it gets a little harder to serve God because of things that come up, that just maybe God is testing us. And look, that's not a, that's not a test that we want to fail. There's a, there's a lot of Christians out there who they're, do, they're going great, uh, they're serving God, but then the obstacle comes and God tests them. He says, I, I, know, they're, I know they're serving me now. I just want to see if they're going to keep doing it. There's a lot of Christians out there who the obstacle comes or the discouragement comes and it slows them down. Suddenly they're, they're not serving God like they were. Suddenly they're not doing what they were. And they're not fighting the good fight of faith as hard and as zealously as they were before. And look, if that happens to us, we failed. Like I said, that's not a test we want to fail. We ought to realize when times like that come. Because look, the two ways God tests people in the Bible are by blessing and by trials. By blessing to see if we're going to kind of forget about God and forget about the God who originally gave us the blessings and, and uh, just, just forget about God and let that hinder us from serving Him. But sometimes by trials, what we just talked about, where he puts those trials there and he wants to see if it's going to hinder us. Because look, if anybody had an excuse to slow down or be a little discouraged or upset, it was our scribes. It was Barak. It was Jeremiah. It was definitely Jeremiah, if you are familiar with his life and his ministry. But you know what? God, God expected them to keep going. God expected them to keep Serving him. If you're there in Jeremiah 36, look down to verse 32. It's the last verse we'll look at tonight. Jeremiah 36, 32 kind of wraps the whole thing up here. This whole story we've spent the evening looking at. Verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Barak the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire. And I don't, don't miss this. Don't miss this. And they were added besides unto them many like words. Not only did God tell him to not stop and to rewrite the scroll and to keep going and, and don't slow down. And, and on top of that, I want you to go back and uh, bring this terrible message to Jehoiakim. But on top of that, you know, they wrote even more. They served God even harder. They wrote even more in that book than, there was, than, than, than was written in there in the first place. 
He said, well, what's the application tonight? What, what, what's, what, what can I learn from the sermon tonight? Here's the application. No matter how the world responds, or the obstacles that come, or how weary it gets, worrying it gets, or how discouraging it gets, or the trials that come our way, no matter what stands between us and God's will, we need to keep serving God. We need to keep, we, we can't stop, we, we, no matter what stands in our way, we have to keep making intercession for the Word of God. Because look, the Bible says the world's waxing worse and worse, is it not? And the worse this world gets, and the more they turn against God, and the more they, they, they refuse to listen to God's Word, the worse things get. The higher of a demand, the greater uh, uh, of a need is there for people who are going to fear God's word, further God's word, and remain faithful to God's word. There, there has never been a time when, when, when there's been a greater need for Christians to stand up and say, you know, I know it's, it's going to be hard. I know it's not going to be easy. I know this obstacle is standing in my way. I know we're going to get weary. But no matter what stands in our way, we, 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 we need, there, there, is a, uh, there is a great need today for Christians who are going to put everything else aside and just give their lives to making intercession for the Word of God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, Thank you for this chapter in the Bible, Lord. Thank you for these men. Thank you for Barak and these scribes, who even though things probably didn't really turn out the way they expected, they still kept going. Thank you for Jeremiah, Lord. I know he's not really in this particular story as much, God, but thank you for a prophet who uh, really just lived his life like this, God, no matter uh, what people's response were, no matter how many times he was beaten or thrown in prison or his life was threatened or no matter uh, what came his way, his whole life was just devoted to thus saith the Lord God. God, I pray you would help us to be like this, God. I pray you would help us tonight, these people right here, God, to, to uh, stay focused on serving you. And even though things may not be super easy all the time and things may get hard, help us to stay focused on, on what you want us to do, God. God, if, if, we, if we don't make intercession for your, your word, God, if these people right here in Fresno, California, are not going to do what it takes to make intercession for your word, Lord, nobody else will. Nobody else will. Pray you be with us, God. Pray you be with this church. God bless it. Pray you be with us tonight and the rest of our week. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.